I want to kind of now uh, move on a little bit from that material on the heart. And so we're, again, this is a course in spiritual theology. And we've, we've kind of talked about the nature of growth a bit, and especially there we focused on issues of moralism and particularly how spiritual formation is grounded in, in the work of Christ. And uh, that, so we spent a fair amount of time. And then we, we did introductory stuff as well. But then that, that, when we started the class, it was really the issues of moralism and how to distinguish that from real spiritual formation in Christ. And then we, we talked about a little bit of, part of it's the nature, but also the process. And we focused on the heart. And because uh, that... That is where all the action is going on. That's where the transformation is happening in the Christian life. All the commands of God about being conformed to the image of Christ, it's all about what's going on in the heart. And so we looked at, um, we looked at the text in Ezekiel 36, 26, and Jeremiah 31, 31. And... Uh, and it turns out that the New Covenant, there's, there's really two dimensions to the New Covenant that we have in Christ. And one of it is, it has to do with the forgiveness of sins, right? It has to do with the righteousness of God, <coughs> right? It ha it's, and so that's going to be the issue of justification. And that's going to be the issue of the work of Christ. And so in these, in these great new covenant promises of the Old Testament, it was about, and I will forgive your sins, right? So there's going to be this forgiveness that God is promising. Not, and if you look at the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews now will quote the, the uh, old covenant, uh, I mean the new covenant that these prophets are prophesying of. And in the book of Hebrews it will say, Look, all of the, the offerings of goats that the priests made and, and the sacrifices and the cleansing, that could never cleanse the conscience. It, it could never deal with sin. It's going to be this one final sacrifice, and that will be the new covenant. But the new covenant, if, if half of it is really based on the work of Christ, the other half is now going to be the work of the Holy Spirit in transformation. And so the, if you remember, the, uh, the writers, the, the prophets are saying, the old covenant you could not keep because remember it's, it, it's a law outside of you and there's no power. And, and 2 Corinthians 3 is going to pick up this theme, that the letter it kills. The letter, when God gave the Torah, humans were not empowered to keep it. And so rather what the Torah did, it, it prompted guilt. It prompted in conscience shame and the human died. So Paul says, when, when, when the law came, I died. When I became conscious of it, I died. So now what the new covenant is, this is going to be a kind of return to Eden, but it's even better because it's a permanent return. And this is where now God is going to say to, to humanity, by the way, you could, never trans you could never transform yourself. Only I can transform your heart because that's what we were made for. And so now the prophecy is I'm going to put my spirit in you and he's going to write Torah on the heart. He is begin to, he's going to transform you from the inside out. So I want to now begin... Uh, and again, we only have three classes left, so we're. So what I'm going to actually do today and part tomorrow, I get with ISF. I get a whole class, a 15-week class that we spend on, and it's on pneumatology and the ministry of the Spirit. So we're just going to kind of taste a little bit, and and you'll in your theology class get a little bit more on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But now I'm going to I'm going to kind of focus on the ministry of the Spirit, and here's what I I have in mind. Um, and the question is, how will, will God bring us 
to perfection? All right, that, that, that's part of the question. So this is uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 and on. It says something like this. Work out your salvation. Now, this isn't, this isn't your initial conversion. It's the ongoing salvation of your soul. It's the ongoing growth. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, think about that. This is now where there's going to be, there is going to be a synergy. So here, sanctification. Um, will be a synergy of my work and God's work. But it's not just that there are, are two wills that having equal responsibility. As we're going to see, um, Philippians 3, it's work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And, and why fear and trembling? Because the Spirit of God is actually at work in you and he's the one who's willing and working for his good pleasure. See, you and I don't will and work for our good pleasure. That's what the Spirit does. The Spirit is the one who's leading. Think of the Spirit as kind of like leading this dance. And your job is to participate with the Spirit. That's why we do it with fear and trembling. right? The idea of fear and trembling is I'm, I want to watch for God's work in my life. See, God is the one who's transforming us, right? It, it, I can't do all that work. And so my task is to participate with him. To put it another way, uh, just Ephesians 5.18, it says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that word filled from Pleroma, this idea of this filling, it turns out this is a present. By the way, how many of you are taking any Greek just so I, I, I know? Okay, so a few. It's a present passive imperative. Right, this idea of to be filled present passive imperative. Now that is a really strange uh, syntactical construction. Now we're, we're, uh, the next two weeks I'm going to talk about the training and, and we'll, we'll talk more about this. But we'll see a couple of verbs where they're, they're unusual verbs. Now what, any, any, anybody know a present passive imperative? What, what's unusual about that? Why that's strange? Yeah. That's the weirdness of it. It's the same one that's going to be, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. It'll be the same thing. It's a present passive imperative. Now, I know, you know, I used to, you know, I used to lift weights. I used to be an athlete. Now, my daughters don't believe that, but I used to. I had actually a trainer train me on in running, lifting weights, because, you know, I, th I thought about going to play college football. And then I became a Christian, and it saved me from uh, radical injury. So that was good. I, <laughs> I decided not to go play football. But anyways, I was a maniacal athlete. And so when the coach told me, John, and it, you know, lift weights. John, bench press this. John, squat this, whatever it was. Well, that is present active imperative. Now, I understand that. A present active imperative is, John, you do this. And it's like, I get it. Lift weights? Yes, I'll go lift weights. I'll go run five miles. Yes, I'll go run five miles. I understand that. But this is, right, this is what we call the voice. This is in the passive voice. And the passive voice means that something's to happen to me. I'm to be filled. But then what's strange about this is it's an imperative. Meaning, right, it's, uh, that's the mood. 
it's a command. And so what it, when it says to be filled with the Spirit, here's what the command really means. It means that I am commanded to allow the Holy Spirit to impact my life. That's the command. To be filled with the, the Spirit is, I'm commanded to be impacted by this person. And, and, and the, the word probably is controlled, filled, because it says, do not get drunk with wine. Don't be controlled by wine, because that's a waste of time. That's a dissipation. But allow yourself to be controlled by the Spirit. Allow yourself to be impacted. So the command of God is this. And, and, and I, I want us to get this really clear. You cannot transform yourself. Now, God gave Aristotle the capacity to do that. God gave Freud the capacity to do that. But they're only going to be doing it partially. Right? There's always going to be distortion because the love of God is not there. So there's always going to be the love of self, the love of pleasure, some distortion at the core. And, and so you guys and, and myself, we transformed ourselves much of our life, even as believers. But at some point, there's the time to wake up to the truth. And that is, you cannot transform yourself. It's the Spirit of God, and it's primarily the love of God, the love and the truth of God that transforms us. Our task is to be open to that love and His presence. And so there's a to point, at, like, I cannot tell my children that when they were five years old. When they became five years old and they became a Christian, and now they're six, I, I, and my, you know, I, I'm giving my, my daughter a command, <coughs> go do your bed. So it's going to turn out that, here's the commands of God. All right, so we get all these commands to uh, obey our parents to love one another, to love God, whatever all those commands are. But it's going to turn out there's a meta-command. And the meta-command of the Christian life is this. Allow the Spirit of God to impact your life. Or another way of putting it, I am commanded to live interactively. I'm commanded to inter live interactively with the Holy Spirit. Notice, the see this is, this when I call this a meta command, you know what that means? It's to color all the other commands. So I'm commanded to love my wife, but, but here's the meta command. John, you cannot really love your wife apart from my love. You can't really do this in your own power. You're going to have to open to me. And so this meta command is supposed to color all the other commands. Because it turns out it's the whole point of the new covenant. It's the whole point of the new covenant. You and I could not keep the law in our own power. And now Jesus did not forgive your sins so that you could keep the law. Jesus forgave your sins so that he could put his spirit in you so that the life of God now could help you to keep the will of God. This is the process where it's going to be. So this, this is going to color all other commands. Now I couldn't tell after Anna came to the Lord at five years old and so uh, here's Anna. None of you look like Anna. So, especially with the beard here, that would be really weird. Uh, so here's Anna, and if I said to Anna, okay, now at six years old, I want you to obey me and go clean your bedroom. But I don't want you to do it in your own power. I want you to sit in your bedroom until you're confident you're filled with the Spirit, until you're open to Him. Well, Anna would just look at me like, I you boo be boo. Okay, Dad. I guess that means I don't have to clean my room because I don't know what the heck you're talking about. And that's why for young believers, young believers, we move them as moralists initially. 
we move them in their fortitude because that's, that's all they know. But we try to do it relationally with them and on the basis of forgiveness. But at some point, when that person can hear it, then we begin to have to say something else. Like, you know something? By the way, I want you to read your Bible. I want you to pray. I want you to do all these spiritual disciplines. But remember this. They don't grow you. All they do, and we'll get to this when we talk about spiritual disciplines, all the spiritual disciplines do is they open you to the one who does grow you. That's what spiritual disciplines are for. They just open you relationally to one, to, to, the, to, to the presence of God. See, a lot of people, when they pick up a Dallas Willard book or, you know, and uh, they just think, wow, this is it. I get to grow myself now. This will really do it. No. These are, think of it like a discipline in marriage. A discipline in marriage, spending time with your spouse. It's, it's to open you relationally to your spouse. It's not just to grow good marital habits. It, it's how do we connect? How do we love one another? This is going to be the same way. So, to put this kind of in a graph, back to this question. How will God bring us to this perfection? Well, here's, here's Adam and Eve. And so, you know, and again, I have to do a little assumption here of Old Testament theology because we don't get a lot of texts about this. But the assumption is, apart from the, from the Spirit of God, no one can please God, right? And so here's Adam and Eve, and, uh, you know, here's, here's, their, here's their heart. Well, it's, and, and then here's their capacities. So here's their capacity for joy. Here's their capacity for desire. Here's their capacity for hope. Here's their capacity for love. Here's their capacity for thought. Here's their capacity for running. Uh, I, I, whatever their capacities are. Somehow the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we, again, we don't know what this was prior to the fall, but somehow the presence of God was there. And here the presence of God is... Uh, we'll just say, somehow impinges upon their heart. We don't know the manner in which, because they weren't fully indwelt like we are. See, we're indwelt and sealed by the Spirit, according to the New Testament. But here they have the Spirit in some way, and what is happening here is there is love and truth with God. See, that's the transformative power. The transformative power is love and truth. And God is so loving them, and this I is so loved, that this, in fact, is what orders all their psychological patterns. This is what makes up a virtuous heart. This is virtue. And it turns out the virtuous heart, <coughs> virtue is when the love of God so orders my soul, my heart, and all its capacities. That's what Adam and Eve had. They were so loved by God that all of their capacities were ordered in love. See, see now in their, in their loves, they, they don't need to love anything inordinately because why? The love of God has met their need. Their desires are all in order. Why? Because the love of God has met all the needs of their desires in their thought life, in their joy life. The love of God has so met their needs that now their soul is ordered. That's actually uh, down here. This will be the eschaton. Right? The eschaton, the the final, the final culmination of human existence. Your death, the beatific vision, or the coming of Christ, right, when we will see God. First John, right, chapter 3 says that we will, this is the beatific vision. When we see God, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will have all of our capacities perfected in love. So what we're going to experience is right back here 
is there's going to be a time in your life where here with the Spirit, you will experience now the real truth of Ephesians 3, 16 to 19, where you will be filled with all the love of Christ and all the fullness of God. Remember that text? Paul prays that we would come to know the heights and the depth and the breadth of the love of Christ and be filled with the fullness of God. Well, that's going to happen one day. And when that happens, there will be such love, it will finally bring to full order all of your capacities, just like Adam and Eve experienced. And then finally, your loves, your thoughts, your desire for recreation, your desires, right? All, you know, there's hundreds of these capacities. They will be fully ordered. And you know what will happen in that day? You will not become an autonomous. See, the question is, in heaven, or, or the new age, uh, you know, the new heavens, the new earth, will we be a robot? Will we just have to love? No, it's this way. You will experience such love that nothing will ever tempt you outside of the love of God anymore. Nothing. You will experience such abundant love that nothing will tempt so that in your mind it's like, no, I need something else. No, I, I need recreation to escape the presence of God. Here are my desires. No, I've got these other disordered desires. No, that, that will be done. That's where we're going. Now the question is, well, how are we, we going to get there? Because here now with the fall, right? In fact, we'll just, we'll, we'll go to the next one here. With the fall and original sin, here, here's my eye. There's a relational hole there now. This is spiritual death, remember? Spiritual death, that is the core sin, right? It's the core thing that's going to get us. Because, I'll get your question in a sec. Because now that is going to slightly disorder all of our capacities. So here's my desires, right? This is what healthy desires would have been. Well, now there's going to be disorder there because the love of God doesn't inform it. That means me and my autonomy, I've got to make life work. <coughs> I've got to make sure I get my pleasure. I've got to make sure that life works for me. And then, of course, if I'm a hell's angel, radical disorder, right? All right, man. Let's be up people tonight. Cool. Wow. That looks disordered. But then there's the sophisticated Aristotle. No. No, we should be generous. We should be kind. We should be loving. He doesn't look very disordered. But he is. He's pervasively disordered because the love of God is not informing it. And so there's always autonomous distortion. And usually at the core, there's going to be a, a disordered love of pleasure. But that would take us into a little bit more systematic theology. So here's a disordered soul. Well, now, so here's all these capacities are, are disordered, more or less. But here was the question before I go to the next one. Yeah, I was wondering if Adam and Eve are really seen as not being filled with that fullness before the fall. Yeah, they don't. They, you know what they are is they don't, they, they, two things go on here is they're not sealed by the Spirit. And, and the sealing of the Spirit is just a metaphor for that he cannot be taken away now because it's going to turn out in salvation. We have the sealing of the Spirit, so the Spirit will never leave us. That is, that is the, that's a promise in the New Covenant that Adam and Eve did not have. Adam and Eve had a different kind of covenant with God than what we have. Now, there's a lot of differences of opinion about what was the nature of the covenant in Adam and Eve. But it wasn't a permanent covenant. It wasn't, a, it wasn't what we call a unilateral promise of God where, where God says, and I will forgive your sins and I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you to walk in my Torah and I will, uh, I'll forget, uh, I will remember your sins no more and, 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 and my spirit and my presence will be with you forever. We don't have that full promise. We actually don't know so much about the promise 
that Adam and Eve had. Um, it was, they were created in a good state, everything's harmonious, be rulers of the earth. Most theologians say, have they just continued in obedience, they would have met some probation date, and then God would have sealed them in righteousness. But what they did was they lost original righteousness, and, and this is what began happening to Adam and Eve. So, so there was something uh, that was not permanent, and also, uh, to go with your question, there was something less probably than we have at Pentecost, but I, I, I don't want to say, I'll put it this way, it's less than here. Because here the love is so overwhelming that we will never be motivated to, out, to sin, to, to act outside of love. Where here, once here's Satan, Satan was able to plant some doubts in them so that Eve begins to doubt, hmm, God may be withholding. That, that's really what, what he does. He, he actually, um, he invokes envy in Eve because Eve begins to think, hmm, God's withholding and now there's doubt. Maybe God, maybe God really doesn't have my interest. And so Satan says, if you stretch forth your hand and take it, wow, you'll become like God. Well, here's pride. Wow, you mean I won't need God? I won't need any, I won't have to depend on him anymore? You mean if I stretch out and reach that thing, I can, I will be self-sufficient? So he's hitting, he's hitting her with these three, these are kind of the core um, vices. So that must, that must meant that there's something already vibrating in Eve, where she can self-vibrate here, outside the love of God. Because she can be tempted where in the eternal state we won't be tempted because the love of God will be so complete in us. So that's why I don't want to put the, the spirit in here just like us. Yeah. So here we have now conversion. And so the conversion of the soul, here now the spirit comes and he's going to begin a ministry in our life. Remember, it's the spirit who transforms. When Dr. Sosi, myself, uh, Bob Sosi, myself, Dave Talley, and some others, we spent a year writing a document on spiritual formation. And we all, we all had, came to the agreement where we included in the document that the Holy Spirit is the agent of change. He is the agent of transformation. You and I are not the agent. We are the recipients. But it's not entirely passive, right? So it's not passive entirely. But it's not active either. And so the word we use is it's interactive. Is I am commanded to open myself to the movement of God. That's what the Christian life is all about. If I'm, if I'm commanded to love my wife, what that command really is is this. Allow God to impact you as you're trying to open to loving your wife. Right? So everything has that meta command. Allow God to impact you. Walk in the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Right? These are, these are the meta commands. So here, the ministry of the Spirit has begun. I'm to open to this. But I still have, now some I have a little less distortion. So if I got to know you really closely, I would probably find in each of your lives, ah, a little distortion, yeah, a little. And then I, ooh. Ooh, that got a little messy. Hey, ooh, but that, ooh, look at that. That's messy. And this might be a secret. All right, you, you haven't talked to many people about that. But I would find in each of your lives some messy pots. And for some of you, it's, it's, it may be messier than, than others. And those become secrets. Those become dark, dirty, little foul places. And these Notice these, all, these, all these places in our character, this is in fact where I am filled. What am I filled with? In my vices, what would I be filled with? Myself, right? I'm filled with self. And now the spirit is gonna begin to work some virtues. And here's the filling of the spirit. 
filling of the Spirit character logically, the fruit of the Spirit, that's, that's slow and steady. And then sometimes we know in, in Acts, the fill, there, remember there's two fillings of the Spirit. Now I'm not going to do a, a systematic theology, you're, you're actually going to get a whole course where you'll talk about the Spirit, or you know, this should come up. Uh, but there's two fillings, right, of the Holy Spirit. And one is the character logical one. That's Ephesians 5.18, be filled, allow the Spirit to impact you. That's Galatians 5.22, let the fruit of the Spirit grow in your life. But then there's also this other filling that's an empowerment or an empowering filling, right? So this is going to be, so if this is the Ephesians and the Galatians, this is going to be a lot what we see in the book of Acts, where Peter, who just 50 days before denied Jesus, he's still a character logical mess, all of a sudden, day of Pentecost comes, boom! Now, the Holy Spirit has come in Peter, and he's going to transform Peter slowly. That's going to happen over his life. But, he wants to empower Peter to preach. And so the presence of God comes on him and he is empowered, the sense of God is here, and he preaches. But this empowering of the book of Acts, um, this is going to come and go. But the indwelling presence of the ministry at Pentecost, that's going to stay. That's the slow and steady, and that's what I'm really talking about here. Right, this is going to be the slow and steady, and so here at conversion, I'm like this, and I'll, I'll get you a question in just a sec. And now, what does growth look like? What does this process now? Here's the Spirit. He has a ministry in my life. What is it for me now to open to the ministry of the Spirit? Because what He wants to do he wants to bear fruit in your life. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bear his fruit. And his fruit are going to be a new character. Right? This is going to be Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good. He wants to take your doubts. He wants to take those vices of the heart. Doubt, unfaith, ang excess anger, lack of peace, hatred. He wants to begin to transform that. So what is that process to open to this transformation? See, it's not your fruit. It's His life. And what is it to open to this new life? So he wants to develop that fruit, but he also wants to develop the fruit of love and ministry. Because he has prepared good works for you to impact the world. So, I want to now begin to talk a little bit about this. What does this look like? And especially the question is, what is the Spirit of God doing? What does he do in our life? If he's the agent of change, well, then I want to know a little bit about what he's doing. But there was a, a question or a thought. Oh, yeah, it was just um, a quick one looking at, like, the language in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And you were saying about the two fillings. Would you say that that corresponds with, like, the difference in the language between the Holy Spirit being in you and coming upon you? Yeah, I, I would. And yet, you know, the, I don't know if the... That's clearly Old Testament language. In the New Testament, it's he's in you, and so there are times when he is working character logical, and then there is times where what some of us spiritual theologians say is he's working ahead of your character. That is, he's giving Peter a sense of, of his presence that is, that is literally exciting Peter. My gosh, God is here. Yes, we are. And he is now preaching, and I probably, I, I don't know, but I might accept even like the vineyard's idea of words of wisdom. You know, Paul says when he talks about gifts in 1 Corinthians, he talks about words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Well, we don't really know what those are because he doesn't define them. He actually, some of them are just, you know, those locutions are just given once. And so it's hard to build a whole theology out of that. But the vineyard says, well, words of wisdom may be that God at times is working in our life 
and and what he's going to do is he's going to take our thoughts and he, by the Spirit in here, he's going to work in such a way that I may, there may be times when I'm preaching or teaching or talking with someone where all of a sudden I realize, whoa, the ante just was upped. I, I'm now saying things I haven't even really kind of thought of before. And there's a ministry going on here that all of a sudden we went into a new groove. Well, I, used, I, you know, I came from more of a cessationist background, so I just, anytime I heard that, I go, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. And then, you know, I, I began to read Grudem, you know, uh, JP and Klaus, my friends over here, uh, they kept giving me, you know, vineyard books. Okay, I'll start reading these. And I started reading them, I was rather, I was rather impacted by them. I was like, hmm, maybe. Jack Deere, a guy from Dallas Seminary, an Old Testament scholar, um, he was really impacted by the Spirit in ways he didn't know. Now, if I have a concern about vineyard, is they focus, in my mind, in the past, not now, the, I'm, I'm quite close with some of the people at Anaheim Vineyard now, but in the past, they probably focused a little too much on empowering. So I went and did a lecture series with them, and they were like, kind of not used to talking about just the indwelling, characterological development of the Spirit and how to open to Him. People were coming and saying, gosh, you know, we're not used to talking about the Spirit this way. We're used to the Spirit, you know, the winds of power coming through and shaking and changing. Well, yeah, that's, that's there. We can be open. I don't have any control of that. But I do have control over this. Control, at least in this sense. I'm commanded to open to it. Now, I don't have control over what the Spirit may do, but I do have control over whether I'm opening or closing or ignoring, or just living in my own power. I, now I do have some control over this. So, yeah, yeah. Well, it says down there the bottom it says new character, and I think Galatians five. Yeah, right. right yeah, the other one is part of his fruit is love and ministry. Yeah, part of the fruit is that we are now ambassadors to transform the world. I'm to, if I'm a plumber, I'm to transform plumbing. Right. If if I'm uh, if I'm working at Home Depot, I'm to transform Home Depot. I'm, I'm to transform what it is to be a Home Depot worker now. Because I'm a member of the kingdom of God now, I've actually am bringing the Holy Spirit to Home Depot. And uh, so if I'm working there, wow, I, I'm a member of the kingdom here. And so there's I, I can have a transformative role there, just working, and 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 I can make disciples too. But, but here now, I'm, I'm trying to bring the reign of God to wherever I go as well, because that's part of his fruit. Because it says in, you know, in Ephesians that he ordained works for us, right? Those are works of the kingdom, right? To bring God's reign wherever we go. So I, I want to be open to that. Yeah? Um, I'm actually on staff at the New Oh, oh, yeah. Hey, cool. All right. Very fair presentation. Yes, yes. We would probably push back and ask, like, where... Where does the power come in this sort of setup to then like impose change almost upon a person? Like not, maybe that's not fair, but. Yeah. Um, like impose, like what, you maybe you want another word or like you a, want to define you, that? You talked about like up in the ante, right? Yeah. Where there's like a, we would say like a word of knowledge. Or a word yes, of that's up in the ante. Yeah. It's because it's like, it's beyond me. Yeah. And so, but that. It's not apart from me, but it's, yeah, it's more that, than me. At that moment, that person isn't, um, the person who's sort of receiving that word, uh, it seems like a different response than what we've talked about in terms of prayer projects, sort of setting ourselves in a spiritual discipline to open right. ourselves to character change. Right. But nevertheless, it, it does tap into the heart, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I, it, to me, and that's where, you know, I, I really don't know. So Klaus and JP have, you know, kind of pushed me. Come on, John, read more. more you know, get this. And yeah, yeah, okay, here, you guys read this. this, this. Yeah. And uh, that's cool. But, you know, we're on pretty much the same page, yeah. a lot of this stuff. And then, and then Betsy Barber here, she's really encouraged me about this, too. So, you know, I, I have known now in the last, especially 10 years teaching here, um, I have seen at times where I'm in the middle of teaching. And again, I come from a cessationist church, John MacArthur. I mean, you, you can't be yeah. more cessationist than he is. Uh, I mean, but he doesn't, he doesn't think all the gifts are gone. He just, you know, he just thought some of the miraculous ones, ah, I don't know, they're going on. I began to see in my own life, uh, I began to have experiences of the Spirit that I didn't quite have a theology for, but I began to see in my teaching 
that I, I, I would be teaching something and then I know something was going on. Like I'll be teaching something and it's like, Bleh. you know, I mean, the, the words are dying. And then all of a sudden I'm teaching and it's like, oh, no, no, God, I know something's happening here. I know something's going on between me and some people here. You have something for them, God. And then I would know sometimes where it's like, whoa. Now, you know, again, you could all, you could, you know, if I had Bruce Nairmore here, you know, my friend at Rosemead School of Psychology, he could have a naturalistic explanation for all this. Because there are times when I'll be teaching and I'm like, whoa, John, you just went into another zone. You just went into another zone. And, and all of a sudden, I'm getting ideas I hadn't had before. Well, is that a word of wisdom? I mean, there are some times where, uh, I don't do it in this class, but with my SF classes, you know, I, while I'm teaching, it's like, ha, excuse me. <laughs> and I, I, I want to write that one down. I haven't thought of that one before. Well, but, you know, Bruce Nairmore could just say, well, John, that's the way learning is. Learning is that in the middle of the interaction with students, you're making new connections, and so something else is there. So I, I, I can go either way. I wish Paul, when he said words of wisdom, oh, could you give me a, a pair, like, how about a paragraph? Yeah. Two sentences would have been helpful. Probably a page would have been good. Like, what the heck are you talking about? Well, so now, you know what I do when I come to class each day, when I teach? I just, I was in San Francisco doing something, and the weeks before I was in uh, Colorado. Uh, before I teach or do a seminar, I, I always just say, Lord, I don't know, I just want to be open to you. I always want to be open to you. But especially, Lord, I want to be open to any words of wisdom, that any ministry that you want to do, where you want to take something within me and, and take it to another level, I, I, I want to be open to that. I think in the past, I just was more close to it. And ever since I began reading these books, now these books haven't, uh, it, that hasn't affected my view of this so much, but, uh, and, and how I think of formation and its essence, um, but it has opened me more than ever to the ministry of the Spirit doing things in this moment that, that I, in the past I might have been more of a naturalist. And so JP's been pushing that forever. Yeah. You know, here at Talbot, maybe we're just such naturalists. And, uh, and I don't want to deny nature, though. It's, it's due as well. Yeah. So when I first read Jack Deere uh, about healing, well, to me, healing ministry, I've always had this idea, ah, well, geez, if you're a healer, well, doggone it, go over to St. Jude and just, you know, dump out the hospital. I mean, but that's not kind of the way it works. It's when God wants to do that. And so I read Jack Deere, and I thought, this is powerful. But you know what he really opened me to? He opened me, and then Ken Birding wrote a book on the gifts as well, uh, undergrad prof here. And where Birding's view of the gifts are, these are more distrib charismatic distributions. They're charismas. They're the spirit. They're distributions of ministry of love for the sake of the common good that can just be for a moment. And that we're to be open to this, rather than to think, well, you know, I, I don't have that gift, so, you know. And especially there's some gifts like mercy. You know, my wife just, oh, Lord, please give John the gift of mercy. And uh, because, you know, when Greta tells me her problems in the past, it would be like, well, you know, God's doing something about that. God's really working in you. So open up to your trial, Greta. And uh, so I wasn't exactly the most empathetic person. Well, and healing especially. That was just totally off my radar. Well, after I read Jack Deere's book, we had my brother and sister-in-law over, and she has so many physical problems. And that night when she was, she was sharing, I had been, I was moved that I, in ways I have never been moved before, with compassion, with love, and a sense that I really, God, I want to pray for this person. And, and so I just, I, I just, Karen, you know, I, I'm the kind of person when someone would ask me, would you pray for a healing, blah, 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 in the past, my lack of empathy was always like, <laughs> Oh, goodness. Go, go ask somebody else to pray for that. I, I, you know, I'll, let me pray for something in your soul, you know. And, uh, but here, I heard that as she was sharing me her problems. I was so opened in love to her. And so open, open also of just trusting God. I, I just wanted to pray for her. And, and so I went over and put my hands on her and prayed. And again, I have no idea. That's, it's up to God whatever he wanted to do. Um, but I think that's a good thing to be open to this. One thing I really appreciate about Lance, as I've gotten to know now Lance, when I did a lecture series there at Anaheim Vineyard, Lance said, you know, my people were looking for the, I, I know ever since John Wimber's left, they're looking for the winds of power to come yeah. rushing through, and some have left that vineyard yeah. because they feel like Ichabod, the spirit's departed, yeah. and let's go find the vineyard where, whoa, it's happening again. And Lance says, no, that's God's, that's God's decision. Our task is to be open. 
But our task is, it's the slow and steady character change. Because this is where all the action is in the New Covenant. The New Covenant is fundamentally, it's the, it's the writing of Torah on the heart, but it's also doing the works of the kingdom too. So, so I, in my, in my uh, community, I've now learned some things from the vineyard. And, and I think the vineyard is now learning things as well about real formation. So it's a cool thing. What does it look like to be open to the Spirit in relation to other believers and their role, the Holy Spirit using them to shape your soul in a sense? Or is, that, yeah. is there, you know, what is that? You know, I'm going to put that one off till we talk the last two weeks about the training. <laughs> yeah, we don't have much time here. So uh, I, I get, you know, I get, well, you know, at ISF, I was just pondering this. At, at, with the Institute for Spiritual Formation, I, we get 44 units of the students, 66 units, to do all the formation here. So I do know that this is just, you know, we're running through. But I, I will talk a little, because in the training part, I will just talk briefly about the role of the body of Christ and what we're to be one another. Because all those one another passages, those become a means of grace for a training. So when, we, when we're going to talk about training, I'm going I'm to really buy a lot of Dallas Willard here. Willard's going to say, in the Christian life, don't try. Train. That's going to be very strong. I, I, I wanna, so we're going to talk about the training quite a bit. It's all about training yourself in righteousness, not trying. And now what are all the means of grace in this training as we're trying to train this self in the spirit in all the other places? See, some of you need to train your anger right now. Some of you need to train your worry. Some of you need to find places that you really need to train. So we're going to talk about what would this, what would the Christian life be if it wasn't trying, but it was training. And, 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 this, and this open to the spirit. So now we're going to have all these means of grace that are going to come in, and one of them is the body. So I'll kind of wait for that. Yeah. Let me um, just turn to Romans 8 for a second, because the question I want to ask now um, is what is the role of the ministry of the Spirit? Because, you know, um, we're like, well, what is he doing? What, what's, what, what's this all about? So just uh, Romans 8, it, uh, what, we, what we do know is, uh, and I'll just start reading um, verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. So we are now, the Pauline terms will be, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll just transliterate it. Uh, I mean, not translate I'll just translate it. We are in the Spirit, right? We are in Numa, and we are in Christ, right? In Christos. Those are the Pauline terms of our existence now. I am in Christ, meaning I'm in full justification. We've talked about that. But now I'm also in the Spirit, meaning I am no longer in the, the domination sphere of the flesh, right? Spirit is always contrasted to flesh. And what do we mean by flesh? What do we mean? What does flesh mean for Paul? That's right, the power of human autonomy. Man, get that. Don't think vice virtue. Think the power of the self. Your life is either in Numa or in Sarks. And you and I now, even though you might say, well, I feel like it's a lot of me, but your existence now is in Numa. You are in a new sphere of existence. Why? Because you're a new creature at the core. Even if you don't feel it, doesn't matter. That is a reality. That's not a doctrine. Just a doctrine. That's a reality. You and I are now in Numa. And now our task is to learn to live in Numa. The world is living in Sarks. That's all it knows. But now we have this new existence and we're often we're, we're babies, you know, in this. And so what is this what are some of the things that the spirit's doing? Look at verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. We're, we're being, see, notice, for all who are being led, 
So one of the Spirit's job is to lead us. I, that means I, I need to learn how to follow. But I guess I first need to learn how to discern and then follow. How, what is the Spirit of God doing? So when I go home tonight and my daughters are having a problem, my tendency is no doubt to live in the flesh. My tendency is to solve the problem. But what would it be now? No, Spirit, you're the one wa wanting to lead this. So now my, my spiritual disciplines are changing a bit. We're now, part of the my new training is if Anna and Krista come to me with something, it might be something like this. While they're talking, I might be, I have one ear to Anna and Krista, and I've got one ear to the Spirit saying, God, what are you trying to do here? Before I act, before I intervene, before I try to straighten it out, because see, I'm just tempted in my own character to straighten it out. You know, I've got a pretty good character. I've got some wisdom. So I could just do it in my own power. But for all of us who are being led by the Spirit, that, that's, so what is it to follow the Spirit in this? So I want to know from the Spirit, what are you doing here? And you know, I really wish every time I asked the question, wouldn't it be cool if every time you asked the question, then you heard, John, this is the Holy Spirit. What I'm about to say. That would be wonderful. But he doesn't do that. He's living in the deep. He's living in my structures now. And so the issue now is to open to God, well, then what might you be doing? So I've got the Word in hand, and I have God in heart, and I'm trying to discern, gosh, what's the best here? And this is a discovery mode. So here, 14, to be led by the Spirit. That's what, a, that's what a Son of God is. And then it says in verse 14, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again. Right? The spirit of slavery would be, is that I'm just enslaved to my passions. But verse 15, But you have received a spirit of adoption of sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So, one of the ministries of the Spirit here in Romans 8 is to lead. The second is this. It's the Holy Spirit who prompts us to pray and look to God. Right? Have you ever been in a situation you go, Oh, God, that wasn't you who did that only. It's the Spirit, right? It's, the, it's by the Spirit that we cry out, Abba, Father. So you're in a situation, you're going, oh God, what's going on? That's the Spirit. Call out to God. Call out to God. See, the Spirit is now, He is, that's what, you know, if 1 Corinthians 6, 17, right, that uh, those who have joined themselves to the Lord are one Spirit with Him. We are now one Spirit relationally. And it's the Spirit who's trying to transfer this. And so anytime I, pr I pray or cry out to God, He's the one doing it. And then here's another part of His ministry, verse 16. And the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The third ministry we see in Romans is it's the Spirit's job the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us certitude about our faith. See, you can't give yourself certitude. I, I used to teach apologetics before JP came. I taught for five years. You cannot, by studying apologetics or by studying theology, give yourself certitude that you're a child of God. Now, I encourage you to study all those things because you know what those become? Those become access by which the Spirit can use to give you that certitude. But it's only, th this is entirely what, uh, um, you know, this is what the Reformers talked about as the illumination of the Holy Spirit. It, it's, it's the Spirit's job to give you certitude that you're a child. He's bearing witness to our spirit. And then the fourth thing that he's doing. And I really love this. So here, but these are in the deep. You know, I wish they were more clear. The scriptures give us clarity. 
And the Spirit now is going to be with us as we engage in the Scriptures and we engage in life. The Spirit's going to lead us, and our task is to discern His, His lead, to follow that. It's the Spirit who's going to prompt us to even pray. If you didn't have the Spirit, you and I wouldn't even pray. That's why the Old Testament, by the way, was so disobedient. I, I was going to be an Old Testament major, and uh, the Lord redeemed me from that one too. Uh, from, he redeemed me from being a textual critic and then Old Testament, but I love the Old Testament. But yet the Old Testament is just filled with unbelief. Remember at certain times of the prophets that they, they, they aren't even going to the temple anymore. And then somebody goes, oh, what's this old building here? Oh, you know, and they tear down the, the front door and they watch, oh my gosh, shifting through the cobwebs. Ark of the Covenant, what's this? That's amazing. The idolatry was so rampant. So sometimes you think that you're kind of idolatrous and you think you're kind of a, a crummy follower of the Lord. Oh my gosh, you and I are succeeding so much more than the Old Testament saints. And why? Because now we have the Spirit and He's the one who's prompting. Like all the times you're prompted, God help me. He's the one who's doing this. And so the Spirit is the one who's, uh, who's bearing witness to our spirit. Our task is to open to this. But now we come to verse 26, and here's the next ministry of the Spirit. <coughs> so I want to open to this. In the same way, uh, maybe I'll give you a little context. Verse, see, he just got done talking about this Spirit. Remember, Romans 7 was, uh, now however you think of Romans 7, the, the difficulty of the Christian life and, and how the Spirit's supposed to give us victory. Or it could be, uh, this was the best the Jew had. And whatever it is, Romans 8 is now the Spirit. The Spirit is where there's going to be freedom. This is where the power is, New Covenant. But then he does say in verse 18, but of course it's not all finished yet. It's not, it hasn't all come yet. The eschaton isn't here. It's only partial. And then he just says, I, I consider the sufferings of this present age not worthy to be compared to the glory that's, that's to revealed. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation is groaning because creation was subjected to futility, right? And so here we say in verse 22, the whole creation groans and suffers pains of childbirth until now. So creation is still, we're still in the fall, we're still in the curse. And then it actually says in verse 23, and not only this, but we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan. See, even, even I groan because, have you ever had those days where it's like, God, God, when are you going to come? When are you going to bring the good? This is, ah. and, and those who go through trials especially experience this. So here, even we groan within ourselves, longing for the redemption. But now there's another groaner, and this is going to be the third thing. The Holy Spirit groans for us. He says this, verse 26, and in the same way the Spirit helps our weaknesses. He helps our weaknesses. See, see, I, I've got all of these weaknesses in my heart here. I've got these distortions, right? Those are the vices. You know, the other way of looking at it is, you know, the, back to these vices in the heart. And so it's in the same way the Spirit, He helps our weaknesses. And then I love Paul's statement here. For we do not know how to pray as we should. Wow, Paul says that about himself. Why is it that we don't know how to pray as we should? Why? Because our heart. Because of our weaknesses. Because of our vices. Because of my distorted desires, my distorted anger, my distorted worry. All of this makes it so I don't know, even know how to pray as I should. But here I have the Spirit. This is, this is really wonderful. In the same way the Spirit helps our weaknesses, for we don't even know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Wow. When Dr. Sosia and I used to teach this material together, uh, Bob Sosia used to say this, that in your deep, God the Spirit is always praying for you, always, for the transformation of your soul. Last night while you were sleeping, the Spirit of God was praying. This is not the ministry of tongues. This is the intercessory ministry of the Spirit in the heart of the believer. So even though you and I don't know how to pray for ourselves as very well, this has become a great consolation to me. Spirit, you know how to pray. 
you know exactly how to pray. And in verse 27 it says, and then the Father, or God, who searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So here, the, 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 the kind of picture is, here is the Spirit, he is interceding for the saints to the Father. Now, of course, it doesn't quite work that way because where is the Father to? Where's the Father? According to John, yeah, he's in here, right? And so the whole Trinity's in here. But anyways, the, the Spirit is interceding with the Father and it says that the Father knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit's talking to him. So how does the Spirit, how does the Father really know what's going on in your heart? The prayer ministry of the Spirit. That's how the Father really knows your heart. Spirit's praying for this. And what is the purpose of this prayer? Verse 29, because whom God foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, so that he might be the firstborn among brethren. <coughs> so here's on this number four. The Holy Spirit groans for us, and that is, he prays. He prays for us that we would be conformed. <coughs> to Christ. That's what the Spirit is praying to the Father about. Because whom God foreknew, right, that's his predestination, whom God foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the Son. This is what the Spirit's praying for. He knows your weaknesses. He knows you don't know how to pray for yourself. So he prays for this. Now, this is the context of Romans 8.28. This is the whole, and we know, everybody knows Romans 8.28. But the context of Romans 8.28 is that we have all these weaknesses and the Spirit is praying for all of these weaknesses. He's praying to the Father that they would be conformed to the image of the Son. And now Romans 8.28, it's the whole purpose here. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. You see, you know what Romans 8.28 is? It's the result of the prayer ministry of the Spirit to the Father on your behalf. That's the whole context for Romans 8.28. Yeah, the whole context for Romans 8.28 is God is now, He is going to use all circumstances in life according to the prayer ministry of the Spirit that He and the Spirit have because they want to conform you to the image of Christ. And so God is then going to cause all of these events here in life. So he's going to take all of your wonderful friends, the wonderful church you go to, your children, uh, hmm, uh, your children, your children, huh. ah, your children, that's when they're angels. Your wife, oh, she's so blessed. Your wife, ah, she's a witch right now. Oh, that person who works next to me, God, what a dear, what a dear person. Oh, that person who works next to me, God, I wish they'd go to, yeah. Imprecatory psalms are for them. God, kill the wicked. God, that guy's so wicked. God is now going to take all these pluses and minuses. You know, your wealth, <laughs> your poverty, I don't know what it is. But he's going, God, now if you're a Calvinist, you might say, a hard Calvinist, you'd say God is actually causing all those events to work together for good. Now the text doesn't say that. So, so the, the Arminian or the, the strong Calvinist, what the text just seems to say is this, is, uh, right, is we just kind of look at what it is. God causes all things to work together for good. It doesn't say he causes all things. Now, I as a hard Calvinist, I, I may actually believe it, but that would take us into another kind of position. But Romans 8, 28 just says this, whatever happens, God is going to cause it to work together for good. See, all of these things here are the result of the prayer ministry of the Spirit. 
That's the whole point of Romans 8, 28. The Spirit has been praying for your weaknesses in ways that you can't, and now the Father says, ah, I'm going to use that. They, I, I'm going to use even that negative because it's going to bring stuff out of the heart. Oh, I'm going to use these positives because that's going to help build some things into the heart. So, see, the Spirit is leading the dance here of your life. He and the Father, right? They are establishing circumstances in your life because those circumstances are going to open your heart for things. They're going to actually bring some stuff out because sometimes what do trials do to you? They just bring all your expectations out. They bring your anger out. They bring your other stuff out. And God says, time to look at that. It's time to look at that. So I want to, I, I want us to just, um, let, let me give you a, a little bit of a prayer request and then I'm going uh, to take us into another uh, uh, element of talking about the Spirit. But here's your prayer request for next time. Uh, this will be the first half of it. I want you to spend just 15 minutes and I want you to just kind of open to these first three elements of the ministry of the Spirit. Just, I want you to, so I want you to read Romans chapter 8 and um, so you can start reading uh, at verse 14 if you wish or just read uh, like Romans 8 verses uh, 12 to 17. And I want you to think of these three things. God, what is it, what is it to learn to follow your leading, the leading of the Spirit in my life? Do I, do I even do that much? Do I even think of that, or am I just always making the lead? Am I leading my life? See, so the first thing is verse 14, being led by the Spirit. God, what would it be to be led by you, to, to discern, to to begin to just ask you, God, I want to follow you. The second thing I want you to consider in this first 15 minutes is, Lord, when I cry out to you and when I pray, the scripture seems to say you're actually the first mover. You know, when Thomas Aquinas writes about this, he calls God the first mover of the heart. He's the prime mover of the universe, but he's actually the first mover in our will. Now, that's, that's a deep mystery. And so I want you just to open to, God, every time I pray, what are you doing? What, what, what are you doing prompting me to pray? Am I open to the prompt? Sometimes do I resist your prompts? What's, what, is it possible to resist your prompt? I just want you to be open to the fact that he's in the core of you, I, I'll have to say, I look back probably in the first 15 years of my Christian life, I really think I, I, I lived most of my life as kind of a naturalist, a little bit of a deist. God is out there, and Jesus died for my sins, but now I'm to obey. I'm to make this. I want you, to, I want you just to open to, what is it to be open to now, this person inside? The third thing to be open to in this first 15 minutes is, um, do I have certitude about my faith? Do, spirit, what does it mean that you bear witness to my spirit that I'm a child of God? Uh, am I really open to that? Uh, are there parts of me that kind of don't trust that? I want you just to open your heart to the spirit's ministry of bearing witness to you that you're a child of the Lord. And then I would like you to end this 15 minutes. Again, so however this goes. God, what is it to live filled with your spirit? What is it to live where I am commanded to be impacted by you? Right? That's the kind of bottom line. I, I, I want you just to begin to play around in your, in your obedience life with what is it to open to another person? The next 15 minutes. I want you to read Romans 8, 26 to 29. In fact, you, you read to 30, eight, Romans 8, 26 to 30. And then I want you to ask the Lord this, God, 
what are you doing with all the circumstances of my life? And I want you to take some circumstances. I want you to take like maybe one or two really good circumstances in your life and just say, God, what are you doing with that? Like, what, are you, what are you doing? Because that's a gift to you. What are you doing with that? What, 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 is, what is the Spirit praying about? See, that's the question. What is the Spirit praying about so that you got that kind of a gift? What was God trying to do? What was the Spirit and the Father talking about that He would give you that? Because that's the context for Romans 8.28. But then I want you to end this, next, this, this second 15 minutes with some of the negative circumstances in your life. Maybe it's somebody in your life that just bugs you. Um, maybe it's a friend that you're just having real problems with or you, you, know, you have an enemy or I don't know what. Or you've got a, a disruptive parent I, I, or kids. Or circumstances, finances. I don't know what it is. Why don't you take some things that are going on in your life that, that they're bugabears in your life. They're, they're thorns. And he wants you to ask because you know these two, these become gifts. And so I want you to ask the same question. What is the Spirit, Father, what are you and the Spirit talking about of what this is trying to do in my life? See, you know what our first move often is, is to try to change the circumstance. That's my first tendency in the flesh. I just want to change it. If I got a crummy situation, change it. No, the first move is, God, what are you doing? God, what are you doing? The second move is then maybe changing it. But the first move you don't want to miss because that's life in the Spirit. What are you doing? Now, I'll say this. The harder the trial is, the harder it's to do this. There's no doubt. And then you probably need another person to help you do it when it's really, really a hard trial. I want to... This is the article that I wrote on the dark night of the soul because I'm interested right now in the work of the Spirit. How does the Spirit work? And I'm interested in... Because if you look at the, the Romans text, the Romans texts are like, well, this is going on in the deep. See, this has led some people to say, well, I don't, even, I don't even bother with the Spirit. I mean, I, I know, of course, I have to say this was my life years and years ago. But in some communities that I talk with, uh, I, I know the pastors have come to, you know, I don't believe the Spirit communicates anything except in His Word. And so I don't even, I, I just ignore it. I, I don't even think about the Spirit. It's just, it's me and the Word. Well, that, that clearly, I think, is contrary to the New Testament. Is that, no, no, we are to open to this other person. But having said that, and, and as, I look at, as I look at some of the ministries that the Spirit has, these aren't like clarified sentences. I'm a little worried when someone tells me, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me this, and the Lord told me this, and the Lord told me this. And in a five-minute discussion, wow, the Lord, my gosh, I don't know if I see that in the New Testament. But again, I can never tell a person, no, the Lord didn't tell you that, unless it's contrary to the Scripture. But I, I can't tell, but I, I think there might be a little kooky spirituality going on. That is, there might be individuals who have such a need to have God be with them that they can't distinguish between just what their own head is saying and the presence of God and they have to literally transform their own thoughts into the mind of God so they can feel okay about themselves and their spirituality. God is telling them all this. I'm just a little concerned about this. But nevertheless, I I'm concerned about both sides. I'm concerned about the, the community I came from where some of those individuals say, look, the Spirit of God, does, he, he's totally at work in the deep. You don't need to worry about that. He's doing that stuff. Our task is the only place that we know that God speaks and, and does work is in the Word of God. Well, now, I don't see that in the New Testament. We're being led by the Spirit. The Spirit's bearing witness to my spirit things. I want to be open, but I'm concerned, on the other hand, with someone who's looking for the Spirit everywhere because they have some need to make sure that, that God is with them and they're not just acting on their own. And so I, I, w I really want to understand, well, what, what's of the Spirit and what's not? 
So what I'm going to be interested in here, I'm going to be interested in the, the experience or the lack of experience that we have of the Spirit. Because if I could spend time with each of you here, I, I want to know, are there times in your life where you were certain that's the movement of the Spirit, that's the work of the Spirit, and then there are other times in your life where you're wondering, God, where are you? What's going on? Why don't you make yourself as clear now as you did at another time of your life? And I'm going to be really concerned about those times in your life or in your disciples' life where they're going to have this, if they're honest with themselves, they're going to say, God, I don't know where you are. I don't feel your presence like at other times. And so I want to talk about this spiritual feelings, the sense of God's presence. And so that's where we're here in the notes. So let, let's, let's, uh, let's just go through these notes. We'll see how far we get today. Because I, I know I won't finish. There are times in our life when God seems close. When God feels present, when Bible reading is insightful, when prayer is wonderful, worship is exciting, even times of brokenness that are deep and meaningful. These are incredible times. These are times that taste so good, we would like them to last forever. I remember when I came to the Lord at 19, for the next five or six years, I had just a sense of God's presence. Something was really good. Wow, God is alive. And I had a sense of that way beyond what my daughters had. When my daughters came at, to the Lord at five years old, they did not have this, whoa! Redemption, saved from sin, Dad, I have found meaning. It wasn't that way at all. That was my experience. And then when I led my dad to the Lord when he was 75, 77, I was waiting for the lights and the buzzer, everything to go off. Well, here's my dad, you know, this North Dakota farmer who ate bologna all his life. I asked my dad, Dad, why, do, why don't you eat something else than bologna? Yeah, it ain't good enough for me. You know, I, I, no, I mean, we could afford something else. No, nah, that's what I do. Wow, bologna every day. So I, I remember, so, so my dad, he, you know, he, he was born in 1908. He lived through the Depression. He lived a tough life. And so my dad, when he came to the Lord, after he lifted his head up, we were in an airport. I was back, in, uh, back east going to graduate school and came to visit us and... Uh, and he had read a long letter, and so he was said, Don, I really want to come to the Lord. I really want to do this. So I said, well, let's pray together. And so after we prayed, he lifted his head up, and he just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it? <laughs> this is good. This is good. <laughs> okay. I thought about that much. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, how this comes. But there are going to be times in our life when God feels so close. But there are going to be the next bullet. There are going to be times when that is not the case. And, and I, I'm just going to tell you, there are going to be times where it will not be the case. Where God is going to now feel distant. You haven't done anything worse. You haven't any... You haven't, now, I'm not, I'm not going to be from here on, I'm not talking about a person who's walking away from the Lord. Someone who just doesn't want anything to do with the Lord anymore. That's a whole other situation. But you haven't, and, and this is where you're going to have to be honest with yourself. Honesty is, is, one, of, is one of those meta-virtues of the spiritual life. Calling it like it is, not the way it should be in your life, but what it really is. Because that's, that's where God is working. He's working where you really are. Not in a fantasy that you and I have about ourselves. So there are going to be times when God feels distant. You haven't done anything worse. You haven't sinned any more than normal. Right? Your vices are still there. Your virtues are developing. But now God is going to seem far away. Have you ever wondered in your deep, God, where are you? Are you there? What is wrong with you? Or God, what's wrong with me? Why do you seem so distant? Why do I feel so dry inside? Why don't I seem to care about you reading the word, prayer, hearing sermons the way I used to? 
What have I done wrong? Or God, what have you done? Now, if you're a moralist, if you're a moralist, these are impossible times. These are going to be impossible times for you because now you're going to feel a lot of shame and guilt about these. What's happened here? This is exactly, uh, I want you to turn to, uh, let, let's start with Psalm 13. Just look, I just want to kind of, want to look at the text. The Psalms, uh, remember, the book of Psalms are the prayers that were sung in the Old Testament community. And when the New Testament church begins, these, this is their hymnal. And it was for centuries. The Psalms, become, are, are, they just become the hymnal of the church all the way through the reformers. And still, you know, we, we have even the Maranatha kind of music and, you know, the new music, they, they still bring this in. These are lament psalms. They're, it's interesting. There are more lament psalms than any other psalms. That's amazing. A lament is a complaint. And there are three complaints that we see in the book of Psalms. Three kinds of complaint. There's, they're all complaints to God, but there's, there's a complaint to God about other people. You know, I'm bugged with these people, God. I'm complaining. There's the complaint to God about yourself. And then there's the complaint to God about God. But there's more lament psalms than anything. So here's the first one. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord? Now, now I tell you, be, before I, I read this psalm, just listen to Psalm 41. This is Psalm 40, verse 1. This is the same David. And in Psalm 41, and, and again, these were sung, but David is praying this, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He brought me out of the pit and he put joy in my mouth and a new song of praise to our God. Oh, that, that's a nice. Wouldn't you like that one? Yeah, I want that one. Here's now Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Now this is to be sung. I, I really wish some of you who are musicians would put this to music because next week in church you can bet 50% of the people in your church to 70% will relate to that song. But if they're hearing some other psalm, what we call a celebration song, it's going to be a disconnect. Right? This, is, this is just a whole issue about contemporary music and contemporary worship. How long will you hide your face from me? Wow, here's David. He just prayed another one. And now it's, God, how long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? Right? He says, I, I, I'm tired of thinking about this. Because his prayers have become just taking counsel in his soul. I'm, just, I'm tired of just thinking about this. How, and now he moves to the enemy. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? God, you haven't, you haven't dealt with this. I've got a trial in my life. God, consider and answer me, O God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy save overcome him. Now, notice in this psalm, there is no resolve of answer of prayer. But in this psalm, at least we have a resolve of commitment. And the resolve of commitment is in verse 5. But nevertheless, I've trusted in you. See, he has no deliverance here. He's complaining to God. God, why don't you answer me? Where are you? Why do you hide your face from me? But nevertheless, God, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to trust you because in the past you've dealt bountifully with me. Now look at Psalm 22. Here's another complaint. Now Psalm 22 is a, is a messianic psalm. But it's more than a messianic psalm. It was a psalm, it was a prayer of David that the Israelites are praying. Psalm 22, 1. Here's David praying. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David feels forsaken in this moment. You know, and this is where honesty, you, you must be honest. What is really going on in your prayer life? I come from a community, bless them, where it would be hard for them to admit this. And you know why it would be hard for them to admit it? It would be like, because these are moralists. Because, well, then they're, 
I, I'm, I'm doing some sin. Because if I wasn't in sin, God would feel close. But I can't be in sin because that's shame and guilt. I should be better. It must be going on. Where they literally are not able to see themselves. They're just not able to look at what's the truth. But in justification, we can come out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverances are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer, and by night I have no rest. And yet I know you're holy. He goes, you know, I know you're holy. And I know you deliver, but verse 6, but I'm a worm. I'm not a man. I'm a reproach. Right, and so on and on this psalm's going to go. Now, uh, let me, I'll just give you some, you can look at, uh, because of time, you can look at Psalm 77. This is a full, full lament psalm. I want to look at um, Psalm 88. That's the last one I'll look at. Psalm 88 is a full lament. There's no let up on the lament. And it's actually, um, let me just turn there a second here. As, as we look at Psalm 88, this is, um, this is a song. Who does it say that the, the person is doing it? Who's the writer of this? What is that? He-Man? Is it He-Man? So we have, yeah, He-Man. You, you know who this individual is? This is, we know this in the Chronicles. He is the song leader of David. He's, he's the guy that David chose to be the choir leader and the song leader. So this is like a, a mature fellow. And notice what he says, O Lord, the God of my salvation, I have cried out by day and in the night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul has had enough troubles, and my soul has drawn down dear to Shoal. I am reckoned among those who go down to the pit. I have become like a man without strength, forsaken among the dead, like the slain who lives in the grave. Verse 6, thou hast put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest places, in the depths. I'm just wondering, how would contemporary music be to this? What would it be to sing this? Your wrath has been on me. Now, we don't know if God's wrath really on him, but that's what his prayer is. That, that's part of the hermeneutics of Psalms. Right? When the psalmist says, God, kill my enemy, we don't know if God's going to kill the enemy. It's only means, the Old Testament theologians will say, that's a legitimate way to pray. That's what it's about. Verse 9, my eye has wasted away because of affliction. I have called upon thee every day. I spread out my hands to thee. And just skipping down, he actually says, are you only going to be kind to those who died? Why don't you be kind to those of us who are alive? Verse 13, but I, Lord, I've cried to you for help. And in the morning, my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you reject my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? This is the song leader that David chose to lead Israel's worship. I was afflicted, about to die. I'm overcome. And notice how he ends at verse 18, just for time. You have removed lover and friend far from me. My acquaintances are in darkness. Whoa. <sighs> wow. See, the Israelites were to sing this because there were some people who were going to be going through this, who were going through trials and spiritual trials. And these were supposed to encourage their soul. So back to the notes. I want to start with, so I, I'm just going to say to you that you will be going through these times. You will go through times in your life where, God, why aren't you as clear to me, as close to me as other times in my life? What is going on? What's the truth? And if we had more time, I would read um, a bunch of the church fathers into the reformers who talk about this. Because this is, this is ubiquitous. This, is, this has been throughout the history of the church. Calvin, Luther, all the way back to the early fathers, Jerome, Augustine, people talking about this experience. So I want to start with the truth, A. Just so we can get out the truth, and then move on to try to understand what is the Spirit of God doing in these times. So here's the truth, A. Number one, God is always present. 
God is always present. That's a theological truth. And he's not just present by his omnipresent. He's present by his indwelling ministry. 2 Peter 1, 4, that we have become partakers of the divine nature. 1 Corinthians 16, those who are joined are one spirit with him. So the truth is, you may not feel like God is near, but he is always near. And so I want to understand, well, tell me more about this. <coughs> and the second point is this, that God will never leave you. This is now a promise of the new covenant. God will never leave you. If you're a moralist, this is going to be hard. This is Romans 8, 35, when Paul, Paul talking about justification here in Romans 8, at the very end of the chapter. And he says, if God gave his own son, who could bring a charge against God's elect now? If we have Christ's righteousness, who could, who could do anything to bring a charge against us? What could possibly separate us from the love of God? And so Paul goes through this long list. There's nothing in heaven and there's nothing on earth. How about this? There is nothing in your heart. There is no act that you can do. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that could separate you from the love of God. You have to really ponder this as a believer. Your sin does not separate you from the love of God anymore. That's just a truth of the new covenant. It, it separates the unbeliever, but your sin does not separate you. In fact, if your sin separated you, you'd be always separated, right? Because remember when Calvin talks about where's the sin? Is the sin in the act and the will? Or is the sin in the character? Well, they're both. You, you wouldn't be acting in the will if it wasn't already in the character. You are responsible for your flesh residue. You're responsible for putting it off. The Spirit is not going to leave us. But then here's the question. Why doesn't God make himself more known? That's the big question. Then. If God is here, and nothing is separating me from the love of God, then why doesn't God come down right now and give us a theophany? You know what a theophany is, right? It's the manifestation of the presence of God in a finite physical form, the burning bush. Well, how many of you would like in the morning the burning Bible experience? Wouldn't that be cool if every morning, whoosh, whoa, it's on fire, but it's not consumed. My God, God's here. I'm not wasting my time. Well, I, every time I preach or teach, I would love the burning podium. Whoosh! That would be incredible. Why doesn't God do it? You know, God is omnipotent, meaning he can do all things logically possible. So why doesn't God give all of us theophanies at every moment? Well, th there's this Christian proverb, and I, I, I beware of Christian proverbs that aren't in the Bible. But there's a Christian proverb that says, you know, if, uh, if something has happened in your life, you're not feeling close to God, take a guess who's moved. It's you. And the ancients say, no. No, that's not right. And so, when I began to study the history of spiritual theology, especially the pastoral literature, I came in contact with a whole host of this literature who address this. Because pastors are doing, whether they call it or whether, whatever they think they're doing, they're out in the world of real people and they're finding out as they're discipling people, wow, people are experiencing sometimes where God seems so close and then another time God seems really distant. What is going on here? And so this, is, um, this study here is actually what I have given myself to studying for the last uh, 17 years. This has become really the, the thing I have uh, written uh, the most on and think probably the most about. And, um, and so I want to share with you now just a taste of this. Um, so we're, we're, in, uh, we're in B now. And here's what the history of the church fathers up into the medievals, into the reformers, especially the pastoral literature. Here's what they noticed, and, and they noticed it in, in their discipleship relationships. They noticed it in their own life, and they noticed it in their disciples. And they began to see this kind of movement 
um, where, and, and this is how they would look at it, um, you know, because of the traditions back in Catholicism and most of the reformers, they believed in infant baptism. So here there was baptism, and at some point here there was confirmation, and, and you know, who knows what's going on in any of this. But here's what they noticed. At some point in the believer's life that they were discipling, and they would be discipling, this is Augustine, Jerome, Bernard of Clairvaux, Bonaventura, John of the Cross, Luther, um, they are discipling hundreds of people and they noticed that there was a time in a person's life and they just, now I'm going to give you the culmination of this and this is St. John of the Cross and he's writing just right, uh, he, he doesn't even know about Luther, he's writing right at the time of the Reformation and he's he and Teresa of Avila are in Spain and they're just kind of outside of this Reformation while they're doing, they're trying to reform Roman Catholicism from in, within. And, uh, and, and they're just, he's just kind of culminating a whole host of traditions since the Church Fathers. They call this position the beginner. And what they meant by a beginner was that no matter what happened in their life, whether they were baptized, confirmed, or maybe they were converted, this is the time when the faith takes. This is when they notice in their disciple, whoa, they're saved. They're talking about their sins being forgiven. This is actually a little bit of 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 and following, right? And so if you have the text, just look at there a second. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. Here we get a little bit of a developmental schema and uh, he says, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake, right? There's little children. So they actually liken this beginner to the little child in 1 John 3, right? Something took. And then he says, and I write to you young men, I'm sorry, I write to you fathers because you know him who's been from the beginning. So this idea of the bookends of, you know, the child, he's come to know God. The father, these fathers, they know God who's been from the beginning, right? The big one, the sovereign one. And I write to you young men because you've overcome the evil one. So here's the wrestling period. And then he repeats this. I've written to you children because you know the father. I've written to you fathers because you know him who's been from the beginning. And I've written to you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. And you overcome the evil one. So they see these bookends, right? The, the child and the father. And both of them know God, but this one just knows him deeply. And then there's this middle period where it looks like there's wrestling going on. So they're kind of looking at these texts. Well, well here's what they say. They say, at this some point, they've noticed in themselves and their disciples, when they became a beginner, and often this was a later convert too, where all of a sudden there was just this sense of the presence of God, this felt presence of God. No, God is here. I'm forgiven. This is my faith. It's not my parents' faith anymore. I want to pray. I want to hear sermons, right? All of a sudden, growth becomes, becomes theirs. And they called this time consolation. And they said that this, this time of consolation is just often an incredible time in a person's life where God is just doing something. It's now personal to them. It's their, it's their life. And then what they noticed is they noticed, and they saw this in just saint after saint, is they noticed there was this plateau period where all of a sudden it's just kind of flattening out. It's not, it's not quite as exciting as it used to be. And then what they noticed, and they saw this over and over and over again. Now I have to say, when I went through Bible college and seminary, I was experiencing quite a bit of this. When I hit, I was about to say cemetery, but seminary. For me, it was starting to plateau. And then, here's what they noticed. It was actually like this. Where it was getting worse and worse and worse of the felt absence of God. God, where are you? And now the believer, and this is not a believer that has turned away from the faith. They came to give this a name, Desolation. And this really surprised them 
because the surprise was, wait a minute, it shouldn't work this way. Because here's this same person here, let's call this time 10, whenever that is. That, that person at time 10 is getting consolation God's with him. And that same person over here, we'll call it time 40, that might be two years later, eight months later, four years later, whatever it is. That same person is more mature, is more characterologically mature, but now has less consolation. And they said, that, that doesn't, that's not how it should be. Here's what they thought it should be. Uh, take, take this little graph here. Let, let's take this horizontal line and let's say this represents character maturity in the Christian life, right? And we'll make this zero. And let's say this, this vertical line represent experience of God, right? Some felt presence of God. Well, here's what we would probably expect. We would expect, well, as we get more mature, well, we'd experience more of God, right? And as we experience more of God, well, we're going to get more mature, right? More mature, more experience of God. That's what we would expect. Now, how many of you would like that spirituality, right? <laughs> you bad. <laughs> Doggone it, because I'm, I'm more mature. And when I left seminary and went on to more graduate school, I began to experience this. Man, I had no idea what was going on. Now, this is quite a while ago. You know, this is 19, uh, I graduate from seminary in 1982. And it's like, you know, God, you're not, I began looking back, you know, those earlier days when I was a young Christian, I was like, God, you're, I was so excited about you. God, where are you? And the more I was going to graduate school, it was like, God, this is getting worse and worse. Where are you? And now I was also really stuck in moralism. And so I began to feel really guilty, real shame. God, what is wrong? Sometimes I'd work harder. You know, we're, we're going we're gonna to spend some time understanding this, and we'll, we'll continue this next time. But let me, let me just say, I have now shared this with a number of pastors in pastor's conferences and uh, with theologians. And now, almost every time I do it at a pastor's conference, or even a theological conference, I'll have a lineup of pastors who want to talk to me afterwards. And they'll come and say, Dr. Coe, you have, you have helped me understand so much of my life because I went through such a time of this, or I'm going through it right now, and I feel so alone. I feel like I can't tell anybody. I feel there's so much shame, there's so much guilt. What is God doing here? Let, let, me, let me just, as we, as we close, uh, let me give you these hypotheses just to get them out there. And then we're going to try to understand it next time and really enter into this. But here's their hypotheses. These are the pastors are trying to figure it out. These are pastors doing spiritual theology, by the way. <coughs> this is now what it is to do spiritual theology. The first thing they, re they, they think is this. Well, it must be that spiritual feelings do not necessarily correlate with maturity. Wow. See, they thought it did. They thought spiritual feelings correlate with maturity, so it should be go up. That's what they thought. But they say, it doesn't work that way. Hmm. Well, that's an empirical truth. Remember, spiritual theology is part empirical. It's part looking at reality, dealing with reality, dealing with the church, what the Spirit's really doing. So here's their, their number two reasoning. If that is the case, then spiritual feelings of God's presence, consolation, and the spiritual feelings of his absence, desolation, are less, at least in the beginning, are less the result of our actions and are more the gifts of God according to his purposes. Whoa. Whoa. What? Now, I, I consolation. That's a gift. Hey, I get that. Yeah. Wait a minute. This? That's a gift? Right? I think that's what I'll give my daughters for Christmas this year. <laughs> Anna and Krista, I give you the gift of desolation. What? 
Could that possibly be a gift? Could, could, could God do that? Why would he do that? So number three, the gift of consolation. I get this. Here's what the gift of consolation is. It's to encourage you and it's to give you a taste of God's presence ahead of your character. Consolation. Now, let me just say, there will be, but see, when I teach ISF, I, I can actually now, I spend 15 weeks. You know, I get a whole you know, semester to talk about because this is going to be a developmental spirituality. And John of the Cross and these individuals came up with schemas to try to understand the different developmental paths you have. And so John of the Cross is in particular, he has six stages that people, that he sees that the church goes through. Well, I'm just going to give you a taste of this because we can't do the whole thing. And so just know there is a consolation that later on in the Christian life is consonant with your character. But this early consolation is actually ahead of your character. Because, like, for me, when I came to the Lord at 19, I was not filled with the Spirit character logically. I was filled mostly with myself. And yet I am getting incredible experiences of consolation. Now, we're going to have to ask a little bit later, next time, why is it that some of you raised in the church didn't get some of this? Or why your consolation was, was a little different? But let me just ask you, how many of you would say, just looking back this as a beginner, that time when your faith really took, where it was like, mm, this is my faith, and then maybe you began to get some consolation. How many of you say that that took place before you were in grammar school? So that would be like, uh, what, five years or younger? How many of you say that, be, that that stage took place? Five years or younger? Yeah, not too many. How many of you say in grammar school? So that would be like 12 and younger, where it really took. So one, any others? 12 or younger? How about junior high? That'd be like middle school, where you're like, ah, oh, I'm saved. Okay, how many high school? Yeah, after high school? Yeah, wow, I got some late, late ones. After, how many of you, um, after, was after college? Yeah, bless you. <laughs> bless you guys. See, that's amazing. Now, he, here's what they say. The gift of consolation are those times when God knows you need encouragement. He knows you need encouragement. And so, even though you're quite full of yourself or you're a young kid, you're still full of yourself. God says, no, no, I need encouragement. So you know what God's going to do? According to these writers, he's going to give you like what they call the bottle or the breast of spiritual milk. So during this time, while you're uh, reading the Bible and you're going, God, this is so good, you know what's really happening? Because you don't have the character for this yet. He just put a, a bottle in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is good. Mm -hmm. Love. I'm praying. You know what's really happening? The bottle's in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is wonderful. I hear a sermon by John MacArthur. Oh my gosh, this is good, but really I'm a little baby with a little bottle hanging in my mouth. This is wonderful. This is a great time because God knows that you need encouragement if you're to do these new behaviors. If it's dry bones all the time according to your character, you're not going to do these. Well then, so no, number, number four then, how to experience this? You're supposed to just really enter into this time. Number four, during times of consolation, you really help your disciples get into this deep. But number five, the gift of desolation. Wow, the gift of desolation. What could this possibly be? This is what it is. It's that time when God knows that you're ready. He wants to now use spiritual disciplines to mirror what is in the heart. This is a time when God is not trying to just give you encouragement to get you to do these behaviors. This is a time the spiritual writers say is when God now takes the bottle away and says, I want you to see what's in your heart now. I want you to see just within your own stuff what's really going on, to show us what's really going on inside, to see ourselves as we really are. Here's what it really is, to see those parts of our heart where we don't love him the coldness in us. God says, I think you're ready, John. 
I think you're ready to have a real conversation. And so, John, I'm going to take the bottle away. And while you're reading the Word, you know what you're going to experience? Just your own self who is dead to this. You'll hear a sermon. Have you ever heard a sermon and it's just as dry as dust? Or have you ever been in a prayer time and your mind is wandering? Or a real quiet time? <laughs> yes, I have. And you know what those times do? If you have the heart for it, if you don't have the heart for it, if you're a moralist, you won't be open to this because you're going to try to crank something out of it. You're going to try to convince yourself it was, an, it was something, everything's fine. But if you have the heart for it, here's what you'll, be, you'll discover. God, God, I really don't want to pray. God, there's part of me that doesn't even hardly believe you're listening. If you're not a moralist, if you're really open to the forgiveness of Christ, come out of hiding. Come out of hiding. Stop covering. See it for what it really is because, the, uh, as we're going to start next time, this is an incredible time of the Lord who is going to take you. Remember the idea of putting off the old man? This is the Lord who is going to put off the old man with you. He is going to take you in your heart if you have a heart to go there. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.